to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, thanks so much for joining me for another episode of A Well-Designed Business. Big treat on the show today. I have the women behind the Ballard Designs podcast. That's right. Ballard Design has a podcast called How to Decorate. And this is a great podcast because it's obviously, it's completely opposite of my podcast. On my podcast, we don't talk about the mirrors, the rugs, the beautiful accents, and how to decorate, right? But on this podcast, that's exactly what Karen, Taryn, and Karen Caroline talk about. They let you unleash your inner decorator designer and talk all things creative and wonderful and beautiful about the industry that you love so much. So that's who I have with me today. I have Karen Mooney, Taryn Schwartz, and Caroline McDonald, the hosts of this podcast, okay? Now, these three women also work at Ballard Designs in different departments. Karen Mooney is, has a background in graphic design, and she is the Senior Vice President of Brand Management for Ballard Design. Taryn is an industrial designer, and she's in the product design department. And Caroline McDonald manages marketing, specifically the How to Decorate blog, and art producing digital marketing photography. So they each have different superpowers over there at Ballard Design, but they come together every week for the Ballard Design podcast, How to Decorate. And today, in addition to the podcast and their responsibilities at Ballard, they are going to talk to us a little bit about the behind the scenes of what it means when you as an interior designer partner with a brand, with a big brand like Ballard. I think sometimes we think that it might be easier than it, than it really is, that we think that it's just a matter of getting lucky, making a couple phone calls, having a couple of connections, and just putting our name in a wonderful product magazine like Ballard Design, right? Well, the reality is, is that these women are here to share with us the behind the scenes of what it really takes, what the responsibility looks like in order to be a designer partner with a big brand like Ballard. And I am, for one, very grateful for their candid conversation. One thing is true, and you can really see, and it comes through, is how much these three women respect each other and how much they each um, have different parts of the company and of the process that they're responsible for, but how important it is that they all work together. And you can also very easily see the passion that they have for their work and for the company Ballard that they work for. So um, I think that you will enjoy this behind the scenes look. And of course, if you are an interior designer that one day hopes and aspires to be lucky enough to work with a brand like Ballard, this will give you an inside, you know, a little inside look on what it takes in order to be prepared, uh, in order to actually get yourself to that point, and then also what it takes in order to execute it at a level that's required with a brand as large and as prestigious as Ballard is. So I hope you enjoy the program. You let us know. Give us our com your comments on Instagram and YouTube. We look forward to hearing them and seeing them. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoy it. My name is Sarah Danielli, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of MyDoma Studio. MyDoma Studio is a software built for interior designers. We specifically do project and client management. We give our interior designers a place to organize all their projects in a studio that is branded specifically to their business. I used to actually be an interior designer, so I can understand firsthand the problems that interior designers have when running a small business. From the paperwork and design decisions that the clients make to collecting payments, just basically all that communication with your client. 
So my Doma Studio was created to manage all those moving pieces and simplify the design business to make it easier. We've had some really great highs. We've absolutely grown our revenue. We have grown our customer base. We are now in 40 plus countries. The trust that the design community and business community has started to put into us. So partnerships are coming up every other day it seems. The company is growing every single month, the partnerships are happening, so really happy with everything overall. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining me for another episode of A Well-Designed Business and I am absolutely delighted to welcome these ladies with us today. I have the women of Ballard Designs with me, the people behind the podcast at Ballard Designs. So in our top left corner, we have Taryn Schwartz with us. Hi Taryn, how are you? Good. Thank you, Lillian. <laughs> and then we have Karen uh, Mooney on, on our bottom left here. Hi. And then we have Caroline McDonald here on the bottom Hi. right. So ladies, this is so fun for me because I don't often get to interview other podcasters. <laughs> <laughs> we never get to interview other podcasters. Yeah. Right, right. And I was also looking through your show list and we have quite a few people that we've interviewed in common. So one of our favorites, we all share our favorite Erica Ward, right? So a big, huge shout out to her. So I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, definitely. And then we have Rachel Cannon, who is another favorite of mine, and Maria Killen. And I mean, like, honestly, it's like picking your children, right? It's like, and then the Madcaps, you, you interviewed yes. the Madcaps, too. They were so. one of our first guests. Yes. I know, right? And and they're, they're, they might actually be one of our only guests that we've done twice. That's true. Except, Except for, for maybe like, like Miles, Miles and Bunny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Very cool. Yeah, you start to develop relationships and you start to say, wait, I could have you back again to talk about something else, right? Yeah. <laughs> I feel like almost all of our guests we could have back multiple times, but then our get our list of guests we want to interview is so long. True. That yes. Yeah, yeah, you have yeah. to keep moving. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes, exactly. So it's um, it's an interesting thing, isn't it, to interview somebody that maybe you've never spoken with before, and then through a forty-five minute or an hour conversation, you feel like you know them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, often we fall in love and we sit around and we never end. You know, you have to actually kick each other out at the end I of the know, night. Yeah, it's time right? to go home. <laughs> I know. Oh, because that's right. You do yours in person. That's I should know that because you invited me to be on and I have to wait until you come to New York in November to do that, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you were like, either house. come to us in Atlanta or you have to wait till we're in New York, right? So that's interesting. Um, you know yeah. that you could change the model and do it like we're doing now via Zoom. What, what is it the reason that you guys like to do the in-person? What's, who, who's, is it something that you all decide? Does it come from higher up in the, in the Ballard uh, Corporation? <laughs> like, where did that come from? Caroline's the boss of us. Wine. Yeah. <laughs> You I drink think. wine while you do it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to wait till November now, ladies. Right? <laughs> it helps well, everybody I think, relax. I think, yeah, I think that we just found like our, that between the three of us especially, our conversation flowed better and we sort of feed off of each other's. And I don't know. I think we, I think it just, I don't know, Taryn and Karen, what do y'all think? I, I think it just, the shows were better when they were in person. And mm -hmm. so we've just almost been like hesitant to change that model because it was working. And so it's like, okay, well, yeah, I agree. I think to be honest that we're friends and that's where it started from. And so we want to hang out together and we work in three different parts of our business. So we don't necessarily work together each day. So we enjoy the podcast and okay. having that time together like friends. Okay. Yeah. Are and you really all working? I'm personal. sorry. Go ahead. It really okay. takes it to a new personal level with mm -hmm. those designers. So it's, it doesn't feel as uh, transactional and businessy. It really mm -hmm. feels like coming to my house, sitting at my table, hanging out. It really feels like a familial relationship. And then they tend to tell us things they might not tell us. Yeah, yeah. I, have to, I have to say, I've gotten some pretty juicy things out of people. <laughs> and I've had, I, not juicy, salacious, but just um, personal. And mm -hmm. I've had people, designers, when we hang up the air, on-air conversation go, 
I don't know how I just ended up telling you all that. <laughs> I'm like, well, I just have this way. <laughs> I so. feel like also it was like in the beginning, we were like a little stage fright. So it helped to like have people there because they kind of, and both us and they would forget that the mics were even, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. there. Oh, and you. so it was like just sitting around Karen's dining room. So. That's interesting. I mean, the your show is amazing, so you obviously make it work, mm-hmm. and I think we just we haven't wanted to mess with our model. So, well, know. that's true. I, and you know, I have to tell you that, of course, I did hundreds of interviews without video before I randomly, for certain select shows, will mm-hmm. ask the de- the guests, you know, could we do it as video as well? And um, it is different when you switch to something from something that you're mm-hmm. comfortable with. Uh, and I think with the three of you, just hearing the dynamic, I can understand. You are friends first. You're hanging out, and the conversation flows. For me, being alone doing it, there are a lot of times, I'm just like the behind the scenes here, there are a lot of times that a guest is on a roll sharing information and I'm literally scribbling notes so that I don't interrupt the guest's train of thought, but I can like, oh, that was really significant and come back to say it. And if it were always video, I would feel very uncomfortable if you're looking at me talking and my head is down, you know? And so- yeah. And yeah, so yeah. It, it, it's, it's funny. And so now I've got my notebook in front of me, but I don't anticipate being able to use it. So I got to keep my brain clicking. <laughs> <laughs> we won't say anything that deep. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So um, are all of you in Ballard working out of the same building? Like when you mentioned you're, you don't see each other that, mu- that often, but you're, you're in the same building, you go to work and there's just in different departments or, or do you work remotely? How does that work? We're all here. Yeah. yeah, we're all in the building. We're just sort of spread out. Um, Caroline and I happen to both be in the marketing department, but we have very different roles. And then Taryn is kind of downstairs at her desk drawing furniture all day. So we, we often don't interact. Yeah, yeah. Well, I work with my husband and it's not nearly as big as Ballard and I go days without seeing him at work. So I get it. <laughs> <laughs> he just, he's so cute. He just texted me about an hour ago and he said, I miss you because I haven't Aww. seen him in three days <laughs> at sweet. night, but not during the day. <laughs> Let him out of the basement. <laughs> <laughs> he'll usually text, he'll just text wife moment. So that means he's thinking about me. (laughs) That's really sweet. He's great. He's a good guy. (laughs) I try and remember to do husband moments once in a while. I have to say he does them much more often than I do. (laughs) Does he listen to this podcast? Yes, not really. No, he doesn't. (laughs) Ours don't either. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I know. Ours don't either. (laughs) No, Um, no. Very few people in my personal life do. My mom does. Yay, mom. (laughs) My mother does. I have to nag her about it. (laughs) It's a funny thing, isn't it, to to be doing a podcast? It's uh, you guys are much younger, clearly, obviously, um, and so maybe it doesn't feel so funny for you. But it is a it's a it's a it's a crazy thing that you could be a podcaster, and like you said, your list is long, and you know you have the Ballard name behind you, so it's probably a little bit easier to open those doors. But I remember for me when I started two and a half years ago, you know. I, I'm emailing people, complete strangers, like, here I am, no name somebody from New Jersey. Would you like to be on my podcast? You know, And that's why Erica, by the way, is one of the people that are very close to my heart because she is very well known in her pond, right? She's a mm-hmm. big designer in the South there. And she had a very, has this very successful blog. And she was one of the first bigger names that said, yes, I'd love to be on your show. And it was, I, you know, it makes a difference. It helps you, you know, it, makes it really feel. does. Mm-hmm. Cause the more people hear about it, the more they want to be on it. And then people start calling you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Thankfully, <laughs> thankfully I've have hit that point. Yeah. yeah you know what I mean? So yeah. PR agents and everybody, you know, reaching out and stuff. So it's fun, but yeah. uh, and you anyway, don't have to explain what a podcast is anymore. Hopefully most people know. <laughs> Oh, you girls don't know, but that was what happened with me when I had the idea for the podcast and I ruminated on it and I came up with my business plan and everything. And then I approached my husband because he's my business partner. And I said, this is what I want to do. I said, you know, I've been talking to you and stuff about making a podcast. And I said, and I'm ready. I have the concept and I want to share the business plan with you. And he was like, okay, so you've been talking about this for three months, but he goes, but what is a podcast anyway? Like I needed (laughs) 
<laughs> he's like, I know you. I'm like, what do you mean? I've been, he's like, well, I didn't really need to know until now you want to spend money on it. <laughs> I actually that's right. think that that's one of the reasons that we have the Ballard podcast because I just sort of got this wild hair that like I wanted a podcast. I wanted Ballard to have one, but no one really knew what it was. And that's probably the only reason they let me do it. Yeah. Because they're like, well, I mean, how, how bad, bad could it be? be? Like, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, and now well, that, I mean, you, you, I was like, what is a podcast? You had to explain it to me. Tell me all about it. Oh, you, to you as well, Karen. Oh, yes. No, I'm oh. old as the hills. I had no idea what it was. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> I, um, I had to, I like sent all, I sent all, I yeah, sent Karen and Taryn and um, some people around the office, a couple that I really liked. And um, I was like, I think we should do this. And yeah. they were like, okay. Right. okay. Well, you're the innovator right, in so. the group. You're the <laughs> innovator. Yes. Yeah. But it's yeah. been fun. It's yeah. been really fun. We've loved it. Yeah. Now, were you ladies friends before Ballard or you became friends through working at Ballard? Through Ballard. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how here. many years have you all worked together? Well, I'm, well, the, I've been I'm the newest. Years. Yeah. So I've been about 18 years. Taryn, you're 10? Yes. 12? Yes. I'm 10. Five. Oh, whoa. So you all look like you're about 25 to me. That's like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Taryn did start right out of college. She did I her did. internship here. Okay. And that's why she's been here 10 years. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wow. I that's my mind blown right there. I was like... <laughs> Okay. Well, it must be nice to live in the South. You ladies are making it work for you, I have to say. <laughs> we do. We love Atlanta. We, we did. really enjoyed it. And also, I have to say, from a strictly business observation, that is a good testament to Ballard. It must be a nice company to work for with such longevity there in, in all of you. So that's a, a good marker for a good place to work because people, you know, people, talented people like yourselves um, don't stay. There's no reason to stay at a company that doesn't make you feel valued and, and respected. So good for you guys that you have a nice place to be. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I love Ballard. I love the Ballard product. I was telling Caroline when I first met her on the telephone that my first house I built, I don't want to tell you now all because, you know, it was a hundred years ago, but um, <laughs> You know, I was, it was Ballard all over the place, opened up my Ballard trade account and had my little Ballard rep. And, you know, this was before online, you know, you had to call them up and fax it over and everything. Oh, wow. oh yeah. We probably didn't even have an 800 number. Yeah. I don't know that you did or you didn't, but you, you did do trade accounts. So that was good for me. I like that. <laughs> And that was also up here in the Northeast, the height of the, um, the, the wave of Tuscan Mediterranean design. Oh and so, you know, you're talking about the late nineties. And so that was just like, okay, I'll take one of these and one of these and one of these and one of these mm -hmm. it was perfect for me. And I loved it. So, <laughs> and a good quality product. And I've, I've been, you know, have a lot of it to this, to this day, have kept the pieces. So I've since got rid of the house, but I have the pieces. So <laughs> we always love to hear that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So ladies, we are going to talk a little bit today um, about how you have these celebrity designers that we have Bunny Williams and we have Miles Red, and you can tell us some of the others, I'm sure, that have whatever. I don't know. Is it licensing? Do they actually design the product for you? You just put their name on it. Like that's what we want to get to a little bit about how that works. And then also about how, I guess, is it, you know, less than 1% of 1% of the designers is ever really going to have the wherewithal to be in this position to have that sort of product recognition or that recognition in your catalog? Like, is it like going to the moon or is it sort of like just, you know, doing a marathon? Like, it's really hard, but you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you need to feel that, you guys? I can start yes. that a little bit. You go ahead. <laughs> um, so we have three designers that we work with. Um, our first designer that we started with, um, not 10 years ago, maybe six, seven years ago, Suzanne Kassler. Mm -hmm. She's actually uh, here in Atlanta. Um, also, I think what you'd call celebrity designer. She has uh, getting ready to launch her third book this fall. Um, then next for us was Bunny Williams. Um, you know, just pedigree, like you die for and then um, third miles red and um, each of them for us was a very different decision as to the why you know Suzanne is 
uh, very reflective of our brand and how we look. And, and it was just sort of took it up another notch for us. Whereas Bunny and Miles um, kind of ex expand into some new looks and new designs and new styles for us. So at that point, that's what we were ready for. And that's what we were looking for in a designer. Um, so when we were looking for designers, we were looking for different things in each designer. Also the types of things that, um, types of products that they have synergy with. So for example, Bunny is an incredible entertainer. She loves to have people over to her home. She's an expert uh, at uh, designing a table setting and a tablescape and she has a passion for uh, dinnerware. And um, so that was definitely a natural fit when we were ready to expand our tabletop category. So that, you know, some of those things really kind of um, come into play when a company like us is looking for a designer. Um, but I will say, and Taryn, you might speak to this a little bit too, um, for us, and I think it's different for a lot of brands or a lot of different types of companies. You know, we're direct to consumer, so we're not wholesaler or anything like that. A lot of designers are partnering with wholesalers. But for us, um, we really look to those designers to come up with the designs and present them to us. They draw them, they present them, we talk about it together, what's gonna work, what isn't gonna work, and then um, it moves on until it finally gets to the marketplace. Um, but so it's not us saying, hey, Bunny, you like this cup? We really like this cup. Want to put your name on it? Yeah, we want to move a, a 19 million dozen of these. Let's put Bunny right. Williams on it. That's not how it works. Definitely not how it works. No. And Taryn, you work really closely with them on the design part. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, like Karen was saying, it's completely um, a relationship between the two of us. And they. Um, the great part about the designers is that they see different things. And they're out there. And they're building these beautiful homes. And... Um, they have they have such an eye that it's great to see what they want to present to us and then we use our knowledge of our customer to speak to what we think like karen was saying what will work like what we think the customer's looking for based on kind of our history and what we've seen sell of ballard product and um and the merging of those two um is where you get these beautiful products that our customers can see touch and want that little bit of a designer and they can now have that piece that a designer actually designed. Um, and I just kind of help facilitate it. You know, I, I help the little details and, oh, our vendor can do this or we can't do that. Um, so, yeah. Okay, I feel totally like Taryn, I need You're to underplay what you do. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I was going to say, okay, Taryn has a, a badass job. Oh, can I say that? <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry. I feel like that's not even a curse anymore when you use it with bad, right? Like, I don't it's almost know. like. I yeah, that's true. Cool. Okay. You're a mother now, Caroline. Okay. <laughs> that's it. Um, Taryn has an amazing job in that when she, a lot of times she'll go to their office or their house. And I remember when we were working on the, or when you were working on the Miles um, introduction, a lot of <laughs> products in his collection were in his house. And oh, yeah. Taryn, we had, we saw pictures of Taryn like, under Miles' bed, like measuring, like crawling around yeah. his house, <laughs> taking yes, pictures, true. taking he, uh, pictures, measuring everything. Yeah, we have a black and uh, chrome uh, bookcase that he that he has in his home that he had custom designed for his home. He loves it, and so we, you know, I climbed under a piano to measure the bottom molding to make sure it was just like Miles' original because he loved it, and so yes. I, I do go to all sorts of measures, literally, to make sure that it was just like any, his product was perfect. So, so you're the connection between the creative and the execution, Taryn. You are the technical, almost, I mean, I was going to say the, um, the engineer. Yeah. You're the engineer that makes yes. sure that this can be physically built. That, and not only, it almost sounded like to me that you were talking about, not only that it can physically be built, but that it does still have some... Um, appeal to what you know is your your typical Ballard client, right? Because there's no point in creating a, a, a piece that, you know, Miles thinks is amazing, you all think is amazing, but your Ballard client goes, what the heck is this doing in this catalog, right? Right. But we, we also want to stretch her. She, like, if these are what the designers are doing, we, you know, we all look up to them. We do want to pull them, but yes, it's definitely like, how far can we pull the right, customer. right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a, the, the, it, there's a little 
thing in there. Like we're going to move, you know, well, look, things change. Like the Coke logo changes, you know, over 25 years, right? So you don't have to stay stuck in a lane, but you don't just about face. You, you, you go a little bit away. And so it sounds like that a designer can either sit down and design from scratch and suggest a piece for your line, or in that case, he's already custom designed it. The design is his, he owns it. And so you're going to adapt it for the to consumer market and make right. it, I'm sure, a whole lot more affordable than it was the first time. Well, <laughs> the bookcase that Taryn was talking about, I recall, um, it's made out of just pipe and yeah. shelves, but he took the pipe and had it all silver plated. So ours is not silver plated. <laughs> Ours is just regular metal. So you're right. We are trying to make it affordable for our customer. Yes. And his was really, really tall. His is like floor to ceiling. And we were like, our customer's never going to buy, uh, you know, a bookcase. Plus we can't ship it. You know, you can't, there's logistical things too that we have to keep in mind. How right. are we going to get that up a staircase or how big will that box actually be to get it to the customer in one piece? Or is it an assembly nightmare? Will they have to have eight people to come in? You know, our designers have teams of people that install. Right. But, so they have very special things that they can create and install, but we have to make sure it's consumer friendly for yeah. sure. Because it's a business. It's oh, a it's a business. <laughs> then after the product is designed, the um, our designers, our, our celebrity designers, or whatever you want to call them, um, stay involved all the way to the creative execution at the very end. So um, they come on the photo shoots, they style those rooms, they decide you know how it's going to look. Um, they're very invested in the final product of the way that that product looks. So um, I would definitely say that it's it's not just a plug and play. They're they're there's a lot. <laughs> Well, and that doesn't surprise me because at that level, when you say they come on the photo shoots and they style the room and so forth, it's their name, right? right. We're going to yeah. open up that catalog. We're going to open up that, you know, and we're going to be like, we're going to either be wowed or we're going to say, really? Right. <laughs> and if his or her name is on it and, and this way, when it is your name on it, not everybody loves it. That's okay. Right. But you have to love it. If you're, you put Bunny Williams, Bunny has to look at that and go, killer tablescape. Love it, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, yeah. Correct. Yeah, so that's awesome. So the thing is then, um, the, the base level is to be very clear and understand that if you are an interior designer and you love design and a la la la, you also have to have this other layer of creativity for actually product design. It's not the, so we established that. Then the second thing is, is that, you know, Miles Red and Bunny and Suzanne, you know, these are not your everyday designers. These are designer royalty. This is a different <laughs> level, right? Am I crazy? Well, no, I feel that way. Feel. <laughs> right, the three I of mean, us are often starstruck when we're working with them because they are so incredibly talented uh -huh. that it's just, it's mind boggling. Honestly. Well, and I also want to say too, not to take away from the talent, but the thing is that what I know from my own experience in window works in almost four decades of working with interior designers is, and I say it on my show often, you your level of success in this field is not nearly as often as equated with your level of talent as a designer. Often you can be extremely, extremely, I will even say Bunny Williams, Miles Red level talented. But if you don't have the design, the business end of the design locked down, you're not going to rise through to that level of expertise and, and renown and, 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 and celebrity that you could. Okay. So if you are of average or terrific talent, then you're not going to rise there. Even if your business sense is there, but you have these people like bunny, like miles, like Susan that have both. Right. And that's that rare designer out there that has both that really has learned to run a well-organized firm that's profitable and has that extraordinary talent. And so what do you need? You need them to have that, I'm sure, for the combination, but what does it break down? So we're listening, you know, there's designers listening and they're thinking, 
I want to be in Ballard Catholic someday. I want to do this. Or I want to approach a different company to do it. It doesn't matter. What do they have to come to the table with beyond the innate ability or that ability to create a product? So that's on the table. But say somebody can create a product, a product that's viable, that's attractive, that's sellable, all of those things. That's, that's not where it stops, right? The criteria for being selected. No. Do you want me to feel this or just one of you ladies want to do it? You got this, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> you got um, Well, yeah. Okay. So let me just say, first of all, it isn't, it, it doesn't end at like 10 products. It's a thousand products. So if you have an idea for, you know, an office collection or something, okay, well that, that's going to last you a week. Then we need 20 more ideas and then we need another 20 and then we need another 20. So it's, it's a never ending machine of design and desire that we want from you. So there's that. <laughs> now, let me ask you that. So why is that because you're going to design a hundred and then maybe only 10 are going to be viable or you actually want that many products in their line under their name in your catalog? Well, because we do, um, we do five seasons a year. And so each of these designers is in at least two of those seasons. Um, so they've got two product introductions a year and each of those introductions has 20, 30, 40 items in it. So ranging from, you know, accessories to rugs or drapery or tabletop or whatever. Um, but it's a lot of items and, and, and it's a, just sort of a never ending machine that you're feeding with ideas. So um, it's, it's, it's endless. Um, but then in addition to that, uh, these designers that we're working with, and I imagine most designers that are generating these many ideas and trying to bring them to market, um, they have a whole kind of group of people on their team that are helping them with that. So it's not like they're spending, you know, 30 minutes a week drawing up a sketch and pushing it over the table to us. They've got a um, uh, several of them have, you know, in-house um, CAD artists or um, designers on their own that are producing these designs that they're bringing and putting in front of us. So it starts with ideas that are softer, um, but they are really taking it far down the path before they turn it over to us. So they have resources internally that they have to uh, have to deal with a company like us. Right. And not to mention the resources internally to produce the items that you're looking for, but also to keep the business running with designing for the clients and, oh, sure. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Yeah, you can separate skills shit. often. It's separate skills that yes. they need to have. Um, so it, whether it's a project manager that's managing all of that or um, someone like Taryn who is a product designer, um, those aren't necessarily the same skills you need to be an interior designer or running an interior design business. So um, if there's resources required for sure. So what and, I'm hearing is it's no joke. That's what I'm hearing. No <laughs> that's so, what I'm hearing. It's a lot of work. Well, I was going to say Taryn and Karen, y'all, um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember because they actually do way more. They're more a part of this aspect of the business than I am. But I remember someone telling me that like, you know, say of our new introductions from a book, like maybe one in 10 actually, or maybe it's one in five or something actually is something that we'll carry for a long time. So I think that also tells you just how many products they really have to do because we want things that are going to sell for years. Like we don't want it to just be for one season. And so if, you know, if it doesn't perform, then they have a hole and they have to, so it's mm -hmm. maybe I'll yeah. speak to it more than I can, but um, it's, yeah, it's just, it's a lot. So what you're saying is they go through this whole process of producing, say, for this particular issue, 10 or 20, let's say 20 products. And of those 20 products, five of them are not selling. So they have to not only come out with the stuff for the next issue, but they have to fill the hole from that product line. Yes. Yes. And, and we'd be delighted if it was only five that didn't work. <laughs> uh, like Caroline said, it's, it's something like, you know, maybe we're happy with like a 20% success rate. So it's a lot of energy. And you're, you're not sure which ones are going to resonate and which ones are. We love them all or we wouldn't put them out there. But the customer doesn't always love them. <laughs> and so 
from a business model standpoint, every industry has its accepted ratio. So that must be the accepted ratio. Like you all have, I'm, so, I'm sure people above you in the Ballard organization. And if they consistently, your designer, uh, celebrity designer is hitting it a 20% margin on the products that are viable and that stay in the marketplace, they're all happy? Or are they, are they like, are you guys kidding me? That's a third collection that only 20% sold. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think they're happy. And it's part of our responsibility to work with them to help share as much as we can about customer data and customer sure. buying habits and trends that we're seeing as far as customer behavior to help guide them because they want to be successful too. So, you know, they don't want to waste their time. So as much information as we can share, we do so that we can all have as much, um, you know, sales, as many sales as we possibly can. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's no fun to put a lot of work and energy into something and then it doesn't sell. And mm -hmm. it, I, I know it's, it can be very frustrating for our designers. They'll be like, well, but what about that thing? Why isn't it? Why well, don't see it? Why isn't it in stock? And we're like, cause nobody <laughs> bought it. And sorry. Um, so it's, it's cause it's very, it's a very different world um, that they're stepping into where they, you know, they're like, but this is the most amazing thing I've ever designed. I mean, like, come on, all of my clients. Yeah. Want it. And it's like, well, the rest of America doesn't. I'm so sorry. Well, and how about that point? I mean, you know, how it's about true. that point? What about like, so it's, it's prestigious to have Bunny and Suzanne and Miles there, but it, you know, my brain just went, well, maybe you need a middle of the road successful designer, but like, you know, a firm that does two or 3 million as opposed to 30 or 40 million, what I'm, I'm guessing numbers, I don't know what those firms earn, but you know what I'm saying? Maybe you, does anybody ever think that or that just doesn't equate now? Well, we have a, a big team of designers that work here. So 90% oh. of our product is all designed internally and we build it by the, the, by by us. the, the level of regular designer. I thought yeah, you were know saying. So, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, because it is different, that world that they live in. It's completely different. I, I, do, do, I do window treatments for designers like that here in Manhattan. The conversations are different. Everything is different. Yes. <laughs> That's well, it's, true. I mean, they just have, and they have their people that's, and it's great because for instance, we have, you know, Miles working on a bed. He's like, oh, I just went down to so-and-so and he made my bed and it's easy. And, and we were like, we can't find a vendor who can mass produce this beautiful hammered look that you want for this post. And, you know, it's just, it is, it is funny how they're like, but I can, I can make it. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, but you know, you know, there's challenges with, you know, your one-off bed that's gorgeous. Right. And an artisan took probably four months to build from right. scratch and you checked on it every week to, to tweak this and tweak that. And it came out perfect. Right. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. And it was $20,000 and we needed right. to do $2,000. Right. So, exactly. yeah, there's a difference. <laughs> exactly. And we need to teach, you know, an assembly line, how to make it, <laughs> you know, like make 20 of them. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So it's interesting. But when I said before, it's to understand that it's no joke. What I was referring to is that I can hear that there are um, a lot of I'm certain contractual, but just obligations that they are under and uh, answerable to, to, to you for that. It's, not just, oh my goodness, you're amazing and you're here and whatever you say is just fine. You know, it's like there's deadlines, I'm hearing it. There's a certain level of production that's required. And I'm uh, quite certain that they don't just call you and say, you know, we're going to be three weeks late with that stuff, right? No, it's oh no. Pressure, right? Oh no. Right. Yeah, it's very, we're, very tight. <laughs> we're like, Karen I mean, is freaking out. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I need your outdoor collection now. Like, send me your ideas now. And that's how it actually works. We're like, um, <laughs> we need this product. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's a big business. Let's be serious. It's a big business. It is. And, and Bunny so Bunny refers to it as sort of a marriage, even though she says that our marriage is better than her marriage with John. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I think we talk more. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but she does refer to it as that. And I think that that's something to keep in mind if you're a designer that's looking to get into a relationship like this, because you need to make sure that there is um, 
a good connection between you and a company that you are going to sign on the dotted line with because it is a very intimate relationship. It lasts a long time. It takes a good year to get a product to market from when you get a, the idea out of your head. Um, so there's a lot of, um, of intimacy and time spent together and you really have to trust each other and respect each other. And so if you uh, are going to get into a long-term relationship with a company like that, you really need to vet them well, uh, find out who you're going to work with internally in that company, what the personalities of those people are, um, because it can, it could easily, I, it hasn't happened for us, thank goodness, but I could see that it could easily be, um, you know, a not happy marriage. <laughs> right. And I mean, therapy. Yes. I mean, and, and, and the thing is when somebody comes to you or you approach somebody, we're going to get to how that actually works. But if it, do, do you as a company, Ballard, do you go into it assuming that it's going to be a multi-issue or multi-year contract? Or is it, we're going to do one, we're going to see how we all get along. Or like, you know, do you date and then you get married? Or do you just like, okay, arranged marriage, let's hope it works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, the, the first time we did it with Suzanne, it was very foreign to us. And really no one had done anything like that out there in our space. So definitely wholesalers were doing that kind of thing, partnering with designers, but nobody that was direct to the consumer had done anything like that. And so we didn't really have anything to model against and we didn't really know what we were doing. And it, and, and it was a big shift internally. Um, so we decided that we would have Suzanne um, style some spreads for us, sort of a guest stylist before we jumped into designing product together so that we could kind of, you know, feel each other out a little bit and make sure that we liked each other. Of course, this was after many meetings and lunches and things like that, where you definitely get to know each other. Um, so that's the way we did it with Suzanne. Now um, with Bunny and Miles, we didn't do that. We really just sort of sat down with them, um, talked about our company, our kind of brand, our ethics, how we approach things. They did the same with us and, and um, talked to us about what they were excited about as far as product lines or because um, one thing that Caroline brought up before the podcast is uh, many designers are already doing lines with other people. And so if we wanted Bunny to do rugs with us, well, that's not possible because she was already doing rugs with Dash and Albert. So there's, um, you know, sometimes limitations already in place that you have to be cognizant of. But, um, but that's really, I mean, that's really the only way we have to vet it. But we do definitely enter into a multi-year contract initially. Um, so because, like I said, it takes a good year to get a product to market. So if you are only doing a year, you won't even know. You know, is it good? Is it bad? Do we like each other? So um, it sounds like it's a long time, but... Um, it, it's just enough time for you to kind of get to know each other and get a, get a couple um, lines out there and see what works, see what doesn't work and kind of build on it. Mm -hmm. Cause we're definitely not the kind of company that's just going to um, do a, a one and done situation. It's not kind of really how we operate. No. Well, I mean, as I said earlier, the fact that the, all of you have worked there for so many years, it, it's, it's, that's another layer of your company. You're looking to make relationships, not only with your employees, but with your celebrity designer and partners. It's your culture, clearly. You know, yeah. it's, a nice, it's a nice culture. It's a nice there's culture. A, well, there's a lot of resources that go in too. Once again, that designer has the idea and drops it out of their head. It's a whole year of people working really hard. So right. we want to walk away from it so quickly. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. Exactly. And we're developing branding and packaging with their name and we make logos for them. And, you know, we have in-store signage for them in our retail stores and stuff. So it's a big investment on our end and we wouldn't want to just, you know, try it once and then give up. Right, exactly. And so you mentioned how you were the first in the space to do this sort of celebrity pairing with the retail. And now it's, it's, it's gotten pretty commonplace. I mean, even Lowe's has celebrities and Smith and Noble has, you know, got the property brothers and Madcap is doing stuff with, I think both Smith and Noble and Calico and so forth. So it's become a much more commonplace, I you know, common is commonplace is really overstating it by the way you know it's not like every you know every single thing but uh it's you, not unusual 
Yes, right. It's not right. It's left the realm of being unusual. And I think that's why so many designer, designers have the thought to aspire to it because it seems possible now, right? It seems more possible that you could do it. I think maybe because um, there's so many people doing it, it, that makes it seem really easy. Yes. You know, and, but I think just seeing behind the scenes with how much work and how big of a time commitment is, it's, I, I don't know, I guess I would certainly never like discourage anyone from aspiring to that, but I think be careful what you wish for. Well, yeah, <laughs> like just just know, just know going in how much of a time suck it really is, you know. Mm-hmm. But so, that is that's Ballard, you know. So we are only speaking to what's how you're, we were. You're right, 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 right. right. Um, and the the natural question to that, the follow up to that is, what is the ROI on it? What can, and I know you can't speak to specifically each of these designers, um, because I'm sure every collection, as you said, is, has its positives and negatives, its sellers, its non-sellers. But Mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is, is that almost any endeavor that we undertake, we are a able to sit and evaluate the amount of work that I expect to put in for the return that I expect to make on it. How does the mix, how does the designer earn their money? Is it on a piece sold? Is it like you just a flat fee for being part of the thing? Like how, not anybody's specific business, but just the model itself. I think um, I can only speak to Ballard's. Right, of course. I'm sure that everyone has their own machinations, but ours is just a simple percent of sales. Okay, so Mm -hmm. it makes everybody very invested in designing and bringing to market the very best thing that they can produce. Because if a designer phones it in, right? (laughs) So you know, one issue. Uh, you know, it's busy. I want to go to Aspen and, you know, my, my own clients are busy. Let's just send them this stuff. If it doesn't sell, you've still, still taken your turn, your time, your firm's time, everything out of your primary business and it's not going to be worthwhile. So that's good. That's incentivized. I like that. Okay. And then the other thing is, I guess, obviously the products just sell better because Bunny Williams says it's beautiful. I mean, is that, that is clearly the fact of it, right? You know, I don't know. I don't know if we can answer that because we don't have a test. You know, you can't like sell it and then put her name on it and see if it sells better. I definitely think that there is some cachet to it um, and that uh, they already bring their own fan base to the table, you know? So people that are big fans of, um, you know, Bunny are going to love Bunny product. Um, Plenty of people have no idea who Bunny Williams is. I mean, oddly, right? (laughs) Right. To us, that seems crazy, but there's, you know, tons of people that have never heard of Suzanne Castle or Miles Rudd or whatever. Um, But, uh, so I, I don't really know if it sells better because their name is on it. I think um, what I have found is that designers, uh, interior designers, like it. They, I think that they trust it a little more. Mm-hmm. If, if Bunny Williams designed that, then I know that that is going to be solidly made, beautifully designed. The proportions are going to be right. It, the details are going to be well thought out. Um, so I think, I, and I've, I've experienced that firsthand with our uh, trade program, um, customers where they and they also are a lot more receptive to cutting edge designs so Miles tends to have some things that are and he doesn't like to say that he likes drama but I think he has some very dramatic pieces um, and the, our designer file definitely responds to those pieces they get it mm-hmm. whereas um, you know someone who is just a Joe Schmo like me might be like man, that is really bold. Yes. Uh, but designers know how to handle that kind of bold and they know how to work that into an interior that becomes fabulous. And so that um, is a nice piece for us because we have a very strong designer file. And so having that synergy between like these really high profile designers making cutting edge product that we can provide to them at a great price is a really nice uh, kind of equation. Right, right. I, I'm going to tell you what, I don't remember the first issue that featured the emerald green sofa, but with Miles <laughs> Reds. But I mean, 
I, everybody listens to my podcast knows I'm not a design junkie. I'm not the girl with the AD. I'm not the, I don't watch the shows, you know, whatever, but I'm on Ballard's mailing list. And so, <laughs> you know, usually if I'm not shopping, I'm not looking because I'm also not a shopper. I'm not a part, you know, like it's not my pastime, but with Ballard, I always will just flip through because I love your catalog. I love your Aww. stuff. I do. And <laughs> this was like, I, I want to say it was like, turn the page. It was right there. And I was like, Oh, sweet Jesus. That green sofa is amazing. <laughs> like it was just like, Whoa. And then the art over it. I mean, I remember it. This was like a year ago. I feel like it was like, yeah. like this fall. I feel like yeah. it was. When it, it was. first came out, was it? See, I remember. <laughs> People that know me are like, wait, you remember that? Like, you don't mm -hmm. track this stuff. I mm -hmm. remembered it. It was, it was just so, and I, to your point, Karen, I could see the regular lay person going, what the heck is putting that mm -hmm. huge emerald green sofa in their house? But a designer is like, oh yeah, let me take a, a one of those. I'll have one of those. Mrs. Smith is going to love that. It's going to be perfect, you know? Exactly. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're fearless, you know? So that's the great part. Well, and that's why we love designers because they push us out of our box and they push us to make those bold statements and just take that chance. And without the designer leading you and holding your hand in that, you know, we all just buy beige all day long. All right. Give me another beige. Give me another Stop beige. Stop talking about my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always make the joke, you know, I've been selling window treatments for uh, 30 some years and the Hunter Douglas, who is a great company, you know, by the way, they're the only innovators truly in the industry and with R&D and everything else that were the leaders of it anyway. And the product that they introduced, I want to call it 82, 83. I remember the salesman coming into our showroom with it uh, was the honeycomb shade, the duet cellular shade. And of course we all kicked them out. We're like, we don't need that. We don't need that. Get that out of here. You know, we've got the regular pleated shade, blah, blah, blah. And so none of us bought it. And, and we were part of a franchise then. So I know none of us bought it. It wasn't like I was one retailer and didn't know what everybody else was doing. Um, but Hunter was very smart in one way. I'm going to give him credit here. What they did was they, the, the reps came around for like a year and a half and we're just like, no, it's like 50% more expensive than the pleated shades that we're selling. We don't care that it's more energy insulating. We don't care that there's no holes in the fabric. Nobody cares. Go away. Right. And so what happened was Hunter Douglas started advertising it to the consumer. They, took, they put it in traditional home and they put it in house beautiful and they put it in red bank back in the day. And all of a sudden here comes, you know, the lady with their little magazine. Hi, uh, do you have this duet thing? And I'm like, for crying out loud, we got to get a duet book, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but where I was going all this was the beige and the book started out this nice little manageable book, two or three shades of white, two or three shades of tan, two or three shades of gray, pop a red and a green in there for God knows who, who's ever going to buy it. That's it. Now the book, I swear to God, it is this, it is this thick. You, you bang it on your leg every time you walk with it. It weighs about 25 pounds. And I say to my rep every time, I said, in 36 years, do you know that I can count on two hands a number of time I've sold anything other than white or off-white out of this stupid book? And you keep adding colors and colors. And colors. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Because so the green and regular body. middle America, we're all happy with white and beige. <laughs> That's exactly right. You well, need we talk about that a lot because we do that in the catalog. Because um, I work with these two girls building a lot of the rooms in the catalogs, and um, we're like, "Is anybody going to buy a purple sofa?" Right. It's like, "Well, it doesn't matter. We want to show them something, get them excited, get them inspired, and then they'll go buy a cream sofa, which yes, is fine." Will. Yes, they will. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. There's a. It's a funny thing. You know what I mean? It's a funny thing. But that's what I have always recognized the role of the designer with all the talented designers that I've worked with over the okay. years. <laughs> Got it, right? Purple sofa. <laughs> yeah, purple sofa, right? <laughs> but that's the thing that, that when you are working with a talented designer and they know which piece to pump, you know, to pu punch that color or which wall or which accessory. And it's, you know, in their hands, it's artwork. It's, it's, it's well done. And so, okay. So I accept that value of the celebrity designer that it's not really necessarily just a consumer that it tracks, but it lets the trade, uh, know that what's possible and, mm -hmm. and more affordable because, you know, look, we have the one percenters in interior design, right? 
we have the, not only the one percenter clients, but we have the one percenter designers, but we have all the rest of the designers that are never going to be able to specify a $20,000 sofa. Well, well, and you want regular people to be able to afford a designer. You know, design shouldn't be exclusive. Um, I think everyone deserves to have a beautiful home that inspires them and makes them feel good when they come home at night. Exactly and right. I often think that people think hiring an interior designer is just, you know, only for the rich. And it definitely isn't. It keeps you from making expensive mistakes and it really will get you that end game that you want and you can work on a budget. And I think people don't realize that. Yes, yeah, no, I agree. I agree. You're going to say I, something there, Caroline? Well, I was just going to say... Um, sort of back to the purple sofa and, and, um, and by miles green sofa. I think that aside from the products they designed for us, that's another thing that I think we all in the company look to, and we hope they're doing for our customer, which is like their spreads that they design their rooms that they'll design for a season are so bold. They're so imaginative. They're different and they look different in, in the catalog. And so even if, um, you know, they're going to buy Miles Sofa in tan, he, like we look to them to like really grab our customer's imagination and like, mm -hmm. so, but, you know, maybe they aren't going to buy Miles crazy something, but they'll flip to the next page because they're like, oh, okay, I'm going to look through this now. And so right. um, I, I guess I just feel like their, their own creativity inspires the rest of us and it um and we want it to inspire our customers and so it's sort of a, a cyclical thing i think mm, yes yeah, definitely yeah, definitely but. it's a, it's a nice interesting concept it's uh but it's clear how much work goes into it both on their part and your part in order to bring it to and when you work with your own in-house designers for all of the other part of the catalog are you switching, like what percentage of content are you switching over? I have been a customer for, for 30 years, you know what I mean here? But is, I don't, not always shopping, so I'm just glancing as opposed to needing. And so how much of that content are you pushing your in-house designers to redesign? Taryn? I guess that's you, Taryn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the actual, the actual number though. Like I do. It's about 20%, 20 to 25% of all the products are new every, every season. Every issue, every season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. my, my team works on, I think we're like at 900 products um, a year and that's just uh, development. Um, so that's not all the product. Like that's not all the product no. that we bring. No. So well, and it's a fine line. It's a too. lot. Right. It's a fine line, Karen. I can understand that on one hand for loyal customers, you need to put new product in so that they feel like there's always a reason to open up. But for loyal customers, you need to have what, you know, they saw it six months ago and they didn't have the budget then. And now they're coming back for it. Cause I know I was in that boat. I'd be like, Oh, good. It's still here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's a fine line of keeping us peaked and interested and, um, but also the stability that we crave and we look to you for probably. And oh yeah, definitely. Sometimes that's hard for the, for the three of us and the people building or sort of designing the book because we get so excited about the new stuff and being in the office, you know, like we see our tried and true sort of things all the time. And so it's easy for us to be like, wait, but we want to use this new thing over here. But it's good to have the reminder that like, no, someone needs to maybe see this couch like mm -hmm. five times before they can really pull the trigger. Right. Well, the and bread I'm and butter. Yeah. And what I also always appreciated as a consumer was, especially in that period of that first three to five years when I built the house and then was continuing to furnish it over the first three to five years. Um, was seeing the same piece in different settings. And it was like, oh, huh, you know, yeah, yeah. I could, and then I, sometimes I'd be like, I would pull out an older catalog. And because what I would do is all the time is I would do my wish list and then what are the things I'm gonna order and blah, blah, blah. And then now the next season would come and I would compare, what do I really want? What do I really need? Blah, blah, blah. And sometimes I would find that I had not tagged an item in one catalog, but I had tagged it in a different catalog. And I'm like, you know what, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs>
you know, <laughs> he's selling you on this now. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's part of our job to make the product, the tried and true bread and butter product look fresh every time. That's right. So That's right. We, we do have winners that have, you know, been in our assortment for 15 years and well, how do I make that look fresh? How can I show the consumer a new way to use that? Or so many items that we do own in our homes, we think about them only in one way. So a console, for instance, the console sitting behind um, Caroline right there. Well, most people think, well, that's okay. That's a living room item. Yeah. Well, no, that'd be great in a bedroom. That'd be really pretty in a really large bathroom. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it goes in a family room or maybe it's in your kitchen. So we have to show interesting, fun, new ways and we're challenging ourselves all the time to do that because it not only makes the product look fresh, it inspires customers. So maybe they're not even buying a new console. Maybe they're like, oh, I've got that. I'll just move it in there, try that, put a new piece of art over it, and I've got something totally fresh. Absolutely. So we really try to be not just selling people things, inspiring them to kind of have a fresh eye in their own home. And, and it's not always about buying something new, although we really, really want them to buy lots of new things. <laughs> Or it is the finish, like you were saying. Maybe she doesn't like green. She saw that green sofa of Miles did and was like, ugh. But then she saw the sofa in a different pattern or fabric and was like, oh my gosh. I have and to have it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, or we show yeah, we show that console in black and you don't even right. notice it because you don't like black. Right. Well, that, that's the truth. I found that with myself as a consumer. If I'm looking for a specific thing, I'm going to go right by and not necessarily look at the fine print that it comes in the color I'm looking for. Right. Exactly. So, so one last uh, end of the conversation I'd like to just cover is we talked about how difficult it is and how much responsibility it is for the, the designer and their firm and how deep their resources need to be in order to take the time away from their business and the team's time away from their primary business in order to really invest what's necessary to create the amount of product that you need them to create in order to come to the table with their half of the bargain intact, right? What, what is the process if there's a designer out there that really is feeling like I'm, I'm firing in all pistons, I've got the team, I've got the resources, I've got the energy, I've got the product ideas. Is it something where you accept pitches or it's like, don't call us, sweetie, when we find you, we'll call you? Because <laughs> it could be that, that, that it could be that if that's what it is, that's totally fine. Well, for us, it was definitely when we were ready to reach out, um, we did. And uh, we, we have people approach us all the time about mm -hmm. doing product lines with us. And we're just sort of at capacity with it right now. We can't manage much more. So we're not really open for business like that. But um, I, I do know that um, a lot of times people work with publicists or people like that who are helping manage their business. And those people might have contacts uh, like, for instance, um, we have people get in touch with us all the time about being on the podcast. So then they've got Caroline as a contact. So then if they have a customer or a client who uh, is interested in this, well, then they're going to know someone's name inside a company. And so they might be able to get your foot in the door that way. Um, and I think a lot of the times it's right place, right time. Uh, and beyond that, I think I think that might be the majority of it a lot of the times, you know, having relationships already out there or cultivating relationships out there so that, you know, when, when it is time, someone thinks of you or you're top of mind um, or, you know, we, we're trolling people's Instagrams all the time and, and creating other kinds of partnerships with designers all the time, whether it's um, doing events in our areas or um, doing conferences or panels and that kind of thing. So um, we developed those relationships, like you said, with Erica Ward with lots of designers. So if we were in the market for another designer, we're going to kind of troll through our memory banks of who have we worked with that we like, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> who's right. nice, who gets along with us, who we like their aesthetic. Um, so it, I think that if you are a designer looking to do something like that, cold calling is one way to do it, but I think developing relationships, being available to do things with partners, um, you know, kind of getting out there and being creative, having a rock and Instagram. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking at all the time and um, would make you sort of top of mind for us. Mm, yeah. It's well I said. feel like that advice is like when you're like talking to it when you're like single and you're wanting to <laughs> like meet someone and That's someone's right. like, just be patient. Like you just put yourself, yourself out there. Out there. 
<laughs> it's just like that. <laughs> it's just like that. Oh, and you're like, that's the most frustrating advice ever. Yeah, like, exactly. I can't actually- I know. like, go to where, you know, do you like to hike? Go on hikes, join hiking clubs, you know? <laughs> it <laughs> was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, it's like, but like it's true. Go? I mean, what a cycling club. <laughs> <laughs> No, but you know what? Do you girls know um, Amy Flurry recipe for press? She's uh, Atlanta area. Only, only through your podcast. I've oh. heard you talk about her, but I don't. I'm not. Yeah. Like- so the reason that I bring Amy up, Amy is um, comes from editorial. Amy spent years as an editorial, um, whatever editorial people are. What are they called? Editors. 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 <laughs> That's all I had. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As an editor of um, some national publications and stuff and had some nice pedigree. And she wrote a book called Recipe for Press. And then she wrote a second edition, Recipe for Press for Interior Designers. And as you were talking, Karen, the entire time I was thinking, and Caroline, maybe you recall her most recent episode a couple of months ago. It was all that. It was like you, you she just literally explained that you you have to have the fundamentals. You have to have a body of work. You have to have good quality photography. You have to have a point of view. You have to have an aesthetic. You have to have all of these things. But the way the door opens is through the relationships. And it's just what you said, Karen, is um, being that good partner out there and being, being nice, like honestly, right? Yeah. It's you, know, you can't be one way, ha ha ha, and then behind the other way, turn the face and do a different thing. And I know that sounds like the most basic of all things that your mother taught you when you were six years old, but the truth is it's so real. It's so true. And um, if you think that you are going to create anything of, of, a, of strong value with a big platform, that is going to touch many people, you have to make sure that you're very nice all the way up and all mm-hmm. the way. It's a very small world. It and is. you know, you can find out anything about anyone. Yeah. And <laughs> so unfortunately everybody's willing door. to say too. Yeah. I also think that like one thing just, and I, I feel certain that everyone in our entire company would say the same thing, but that Miles, Bunny and Suzanne all have in common is they're all, first of all, so nice just really genuinely nice people, but they're also like, they're just really passionate about the first part of their business, which is just designing houses for clients. Yes. And they're just so knowledgeable. I mean, we recorded an episode of the podcast with Bunny recently and just like her knowledge yeah. of decorating is just so deep and she's so passionate about sharing it. And I think that, um, yeah, they just, I don't, I mean, I don't know I can't speak to like their motivations at all, but to me, I just get the feeling that like they started this just because they loved it, not because they had these grand goals of like having a, you know, product line one day. They just, they just were, they're really good. They're really good people. They're really talented. They're very generous with their time. And Mm. so that makes it it's really an authentic passion. Them. It's an authentic passion yeah. and talent that it right. combines in, in with their business acumen, or at least yeah. their ability to hire the business acumen. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know for them. I don't know them personally. So, um, but um, you know, Bunny is right here in New York, and I did. We did have um, Audrey Marguerite come to our showroom at Window Works and and do a presentation, and she is from the Bunny Williams company, and she's. You know, I, I, I started by saying when you guys all told me how long you've worked there, to me, that says something about the company. When I met Audrey uh, Margaret at the showroom and she was just so sweet and so genuine and so willing to share. She runs the Instagram for uh, Bunny Williams Home, I believe. I hope I'm getting the, the details right. But, um, you know, I'm like, this nice person must be working for a nice, co- nice person too, you know. Right, right. It definitely trickles down, I think. Mm-hmm. The vibe of a company. Absolutely. The Absolutely. The culture is established by the leader. That is the truth. So, well, you ladies are awesome. I just have had such a nice time with you. And yeah. I really, really do appreciate uh, your sharing the, you know, pulling the curtain back on this. It is, um, I, there's more there than I imagined. And um, I think that it is something that like, like you said, Carolyn, you don't want to discourage anyone from ever aspiring to something like this, but, um, you know, open eyes, know what it's about, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
you know, it's yeah. kind of like, you know, if you, you, when you are, you know, maybe you, you, you yourself might have been um, a really uh, up and coming and athlete or a kid that you have or something like that. And it's, it's so much more than just the game time. You know, it's back and forth to the pitching lessons, back and forth to the ice hockey, you know, court. It's, it's all of the other stuff that, you know, the grand slam in the, you know, the bottom of the ninth and wins the game. It's not just that. It's all those hours that go in that, you know, and they open up the catalog and it looks beautiful. So. Yeah, it's a team team effort for sure. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, (laughs) Yeah, definitely, definitely. And your guys are a great team. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank Thank you for having us. This was really fun. It was. All right. If you want more information on anything that is having to do with this podcast, the guests that I have on it, the live events that I'm having, the coaching events that I'm having, or my book, just head over to luannnigara.com. Thank you so much for joining me today. Decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.